Social distancing and stay-at-home orders meant to stop the spread of COVID-19 may be causing another pandemic, a rise in domestic violence. We look at the telltale signs of abuse and local resources to help survivors. That and more. Stay with us as we dive into your South Florida. Hello and welcome to Your South Florida. I'm Sandra Victorova filling in for Pam Giganti. Well, according to the Florida Department of Children and Families, last year more than 100,000 crimes of domestic violence were reported to law enforcement statewide, resulting in more than 66,000 arrests. While those numbers are alarming, experts say they don't even show the full scope of the violence. Many survivors don't report their abusers because of fear, shame, or being prevented from doing so by their abusers. Then when the pandemic hit, experts feared stay-at-home orders would cause a rise in domestic violence and make it even more difficult for survivors to get help. As part of our recent town hall, I was joined by Women in Distress of Broward County President and CEO Linda Parker, AVDA's Program Services Director Jennifer Gray, and Family and Marital Law Attorney Jonathan Schiller to talk about the pandemic's impact on domestic violence and ways survivors can safely find the help that they need. So Linda, let me start with you. Before we get into the impact of the pandemic, which is really important, tonight is about getting the community involved in the battle against the violence. And that means we all need to know the warning signs of domestic abuse. So talk us through that. There's a variety of um, warning signs that you will see. You know, we have the traditional signs of um, you know, bruises, you may see some uh, physical signs. There also are a lot of emotional signs that go along with domestic violence. You know, you may see your family members withdrawing from activities. They may say things that they can't join because the abuser has a reason for them not to be involved. Uh, you may hear them things say, say things like, um, you know, they can't, they don't have control of their dollars, their money, they can't get a job. Um, they're not allowed. There's a lot of um, allowed type language in some of those uh, cases. They also might um, distance themselves just because they're either trying to protect you or the abuser has walled them off from friends and family. So although we talk a lot about the physical signs, um, a lot of the times it is something that you may not initially look for uh, large amounts of jealousy, um, you know, just be out of your out of your friends and your family that you may never have seen before and um, it may be make you a little concerned or confused so Jennifer what can we do if we see some of those warning signs in someone we care about we want to help but how do we help them in a safe way the way in which family and friends can respond in a safe way would be to find a time when the um, survivor may be by themselves and have a conversation to let them know that they see that these warning signs exist, um, that they are concerned about this, uh, their friend or their family member's safety, and that they really care about them and want to provide support and access to resources. So it's important for friends and family to um, know that there are certified domestic violence centers throughout the state of Florida. Here in South Florida, we have them all throughout the Tri-County area. And um, knowing that they can give that phone number to the 24-hour hotlines of the domestic violence centers in their county so that their friend or their family member could reach out to talk to somebody for um, answering questions, um, gathering information, talking about their situation, making plans for uh, their their potential fleeing from this relationship. So it's it's one way to to get involved without having to necessarily um, get directly involved in a situation that would be unsafe. It's also important, I think, too, for people to understand that if they are, I, I talk a lot about the fact that we do live in South Florida. Um, there's a lot of apartment homes, a lot of condos, a lot of uh, townhouses and single family units that are very close to each other. And we may actually hear the violence going on in our neighbors' homes. And it's not safe for people to intervene, but it certainly is a time when they could call law enforcement and ask them to go out and do a wellness check on that family and see if there's any interventions that law enforcement could make at that time. 
John, from, from a legal standpoint, you know, can anything be done if, if a survivor doesn't participate in criminal prosecution of their abusers? So that's a good question. So I think when you look at the, in the context of domestic violence, there are criminal cases that are, are, are brought before the court. Um, each state attorney is required to develop specialized units who, who are trained in dealing with domestic violence and the prosecution of domestic violence cases. Um, you know, the, the, in fact, the, the statute requires the state attorneys to have a pro-prosecution policy. Um, but ultimately, the consent of a victim, or in this case, a survivor, is not required for the prosecution to prosecute. So, um, you know, the state attorney does have some discretion in terms of whether or not to move forward with the case, even without the participation of a victim, similar to other crimes. Um, but, um, you know, if, if we're talking about in, uh, domestic violence in general, um, you know, the, if we're talking about someone who's looking to get protection from being the victim by seeking a temporary injunction or even a permanent injunction, the state can't force someone to file a civil complaint for a restraining order or a, 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 that type of relief. So um, there is a nuance between whether it's a criminal or civil, but obviously the purpose of the statutes is to to protect and we want people to come forward just like our, our um, you know we were talking about if you see your what you have a neighbor going through some of those types of things to bring it to the court and someone's attention um, you know we want people to come forward with these types of allegations uh, but in certain circumstances the, the 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 abuser doesn't allow them to so if the if the if the police come forward have made a determination of probable cause it then will go to the state attorney's office to make a determination as to whether to proceed forward. So, Linda, you know, uh, there's a good chance someone out there is listening and um, they may feel like they need help. So let's talk to them a moment. What, or, or let's say we have a friend or a family member um, that we know needs help. What, what is the first step for survivors of domestic abuse? And I'm hoping you can um, explain the term safety plan, because I know that's sort of key to the process. You know, it really is. And one of the first things I would share with friends and family, and, and this kind of goes back to a little bit the talk earlier is, um, if you have friends and family that are experiencing this, one of the biggest things that I would encourage is to stay connected to them. Um, one of the things that we see a lot in this work is frustration with folks that, um, you know, it about seven times for someone to leave an abuser for a variety of reasons. So we really want to encourage you to stay focused with your friend and be, be a support system. But beyond that, when it comes to safety planning, it really is individualized based on the, the nature of the person. You know, we talk about safety planning for leaving. Sometimes we actually safety plan. We've done a lot of this in the COVID time, safety planning for how to stay. And that sounds kind of odd, but we, an abuser will understand, or a victim will, or a survivor will understand a lot more effectively what their own individual situation is. And sometimes in the moment, it's not a good time to leave. So safety planning is a way that we work with survivors to look at their situation holistically and decide when they're ready to leave, what do you need to do? For instance, what do you take with you? Um, are there children involved? Are there pets involved? What kind of steps do we need to make sure that you're safe when you leave? I think everyone who works in domestic violence and who has um, law enforcement, all of us understand that one of the uh, most strenuous and most deadly times is when a survivor is leaving and has made that choice for themselves. And so we need to understand and, and work with that survivor to protect themselves when they're ready to leave, but also if they choose to stay. So we focus on how on the basics, um, safety in leaving, safety in getting the children out of the house, what documents do you need to worry about taking? And then additionally, at what point does that matter and it's just time to go? So we talk about all of those things on a spectrum. I will say that the National Organization for Domestic Violence has a great tool on their website and they have a safety plan it will take you through a step-by-step -step process and talks about the different parts of a safety plan and what you personally need to do in your own individual situation. 
Additionally, any of the hotlines that you call, including the Florida statewide hotline or any of our locations, will do the same thing with you. We'll talk you through a plan. We'll ask you a, a bunch of questions about your situation, if you need immediate shelter, um, and we'll take you through all of those resources based on your answers and what's available in your area and get you into a safe situation. Same thing with your friends and family. So Jennifer, what are you hearing from, from ABDA clients? You know, we were hearing that, um, you know, numbers were plummeting, um, at least initially when the pandemic hit, um, that, you know, calls to abuse lines were going down. Um, are, are clients finding it more difficult to reach out for help since the pandemic? Sure. So what we know is that individuals who are asked to stay at home and shelter in place in order to prevent the spread of COVID are, if they're in an abusive relationship, they're being asked to stay at home in a house with their abuser most of the day. Even where we are now in um, parts of South Florida opening back up again, the, the message still is, you know, you can do some things, but not all things. And so they're still... Um, they're still being asked to be at home. And so with that, when they're finding it more difficult, um, what, what they're finding more difficult is actually making the phone calls to the hotlines. And so traditionally, our hotlines have been all phone-based. And so you'd have to make a call and speak live to an individual um, that's on the other end of the phone for, for safety planning, for um, getting access to the shelter programs if they needed to leave. And so one of the things that we did at our organization, and I know lots of organizations around Florida, as well as I believe the state hotline, is now text-enabled. So using a secure um, system. We have uh, text enabled our hotlines. Uh, someone will text us and then we text them back with a secure link and they will have a conversation with us through that secure link. We will also remind them um, to delete the original text that they sent us because that's not through the origin that the, through the secure link and will not delete automatically. Um, but when we finish our conversation through that secure link, the conversation is immediately erased off of their phone. So they can quietly in their home um, and discreetly plan for safety if they're able to use that service. Um, a, it might make it a little bit easier for some, but that's really been the challenge is their consistent uh, connection and in the same spaces with their abusers, finding it hard to get away and make those plans for safety. Linda, would you would you agree? Are you hearing the same thing from, from the folks that you're assisting? I, I do agree with that assessment. And I would add also that, you know, the traditional ways that we were able to help uh, folks leave their current situation so we can provide a, a variety of ways to help folks leave are not available right now. So we have to be extremely creative with how we help survivors leave their situation. Um, and we also have had an increase in hotline just needing people just to, they understand that they want to leave at some point but they just don't feel like now is the time. So, you know, we talked a lot with our advocates about how do you coach someone through staying, which is a different um, animal sometimes than what we deal with as staff. And so that's been a challenge as well, you know, working with the staff on understanding how we coach through, through those issues and how we um, work through a difference in safety but the text for the hotline has been instrumental in getting survivors that, you know, it's not unusual for you to be on your phone at text, to be texting at home, but it might be unusual for you to pick up your phone and make a phone call. John, are, are you seeing an increase in the number of people looking for, you know, legal help to get out of a situation like this or, or looking for protection? One of the things we were talking about earlier, I, I, I know I was recently talking to an attorney who does civil cases, but you know, he was saying how there's such a backup in the court system. And it made me, you know, think about, you know, the women who may want help and are thinking, well, even if I go try to get legal help, there's such a backlog in cases. Talk to us about that. Well, I think that initially there was kind of, nobody knew what to do with regard to this pandemic. And there was probably a lull. Um, we definitely saw, I saw an increase in, in potential cases and cases in the you know May June July kind of period of time, um, you know yes the courthouse is closed to in person type of matters. However, uh, thankfully we have the benefit of Zoom and, and these types of uh, technologies that allow us to appear 
you know, in person or instead of in person by, you know, technology. So everything is being done by e-filing nowadays with regard to these types of matters. And, and just to be clear, you know, when we're talking about domestic violence, if someone is in imminent danger or has already been the victim of domestic violence, they can immediately file for an emergency petition for the protection against domestic violence. There's a Supreme Court standard form. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes to fill out. There's no filing fee. You, can, you don't need an attorney to do it. However, we can get, I'll talk about that in a little bit as to why it might be beneficial in some cases to have an attorney. But you can e-file these in most counties um, and you will get a result within that same day. So if, and, and there are temporary measures the court can put in place if you meet the probable cause criteria. And so, so some people who are looking for help, you know, they might feel like they're trapped and helpless um, because one, not only are they being abused physically, but they're also being controlled emotionally or even financially. Um, those things can be addressed in the petition as well. Not only can you seek an, an immediate injunction to protect yourself from any further danger or your child, you can also seek immediate financial relief. You can seek immediate relief for the, the um, exclusive use and possession of your home. You can seek um, you know, certain rights for the, the custody of the child. So there are, there are mechanisms in place. And although the system has you know, been slowed down, the courts are keeping up, at least in the domestic violence arena, we are keeping up with these cases and the courts are dealing with these emergencies as best they can. Um, so, you know, I, I, just for anyone who knows of a survivor or a victim or is going through this yourself um, or a family member, you know, look, reach out to some of the resources that are available to you. I, I understand that this might be the worst possible time to seek help. But there is help out there, and you can get relief from a court if you, if you go in front and you, and you take advantage of that. Before we continue, earlier we spoke with Yvonne Mesa, who leads Miami-Dade County's nonprofit Safe Space Foundation. Yvonne shared how her team is helping survivors of domestic violence. My name is Yvonne Mesa. I am with Miami-Dade County Community Action and Human Services Department. I am the Bureau Chief for the Targeted Services Bureau, which includes Save Space. Save Space is a shelter for battered women and their children, and we offer emergency services and emergency shelter, which means that a victim and her dependent children can stay with us. Normally, emergency shelter goes up to two months approximately, but because of COVID-19, we have really extended the length of time that a victim can stay with us. So now we have victims that have been with us since the beginning of the pandemic. And while they are in shelter, we provide a variety of services. We provide uh, therapy, individual uh, and group. We provide uh, support groups, many different types of support groups. We provide financial literacy. We provide rental assistance so that when they are ready to leave the shelter, they can actually get some help to uh, rent an apartment or to actually move on their own. We also provide legal services, immigration legal services, as well as family legal services for the solution of marriages and divorce. We also provide assistance for injunctions for protections and much more. If you're a victim of domestic violence, you can get to us in many different ways. Sometimes victims will call the hotline, which is a 24 hour, seven days a week hotline. They also come through our outreach program, which is called the Coordinated Victims Assistance Center which is open Monday through Friday. In many instances, we receive referrals directly from the police, from the state attorney's office. During the beginning of the pandemic, we experienced a decrease on the number of clients that were coming out, calling the hotline, and somehow seeking uh, our services. But we immediately engaged in two different uh, community awareness campaigns. And through those campaigns, we were able to put a lot of signs in the community, a lot of digital signs, uh, put signs in a lot of different places. We expanded our services to include texting because we knew that a lot of victims may be at home and they be surrounded by either the batter or the family of, of the batter, and they may not have a way of contacting us. There was a time in which the phone calls, the hotline was kind of a slow, uh, not the case anymore. Clients are calling, clients are seeking out help, and we feel that in that regard, we're back to normal. We're back to, we're open, 
of course, not only in our shelters, but we're also open uh, with regard to a, to a coordinated victims assistance center, which is the outreach component of the shelter. And in that particular program, I can tell you we're busier than ever. We never closed. So we're constantly seeing clients. What we also did was that we adjusted to, to the new situation by, for example, doing a lot of the things that we used to do in person, such as, for example, an injunction for protection. We developed strategies so that we could do that over the phone. And I can tell you that now we're back to normal. Uh, unfortunately, because what we do is something that, it means that a lot of victims are actually suffering from this. But if they're suffering, we want them to know that we're ready for them, that we're here to help them. In my experience of so many years working with this population, I have come, in, I have come across, I would say, thousands and thousands of victims of domestic violence. And I have had the privilege of seeing the trajectory of many, many victims from the point in which they came into our office broken, um, suffering from a lot of different things, um, not being able to do much, because they were overwhelmed by the fear, uh, by the lack of resources. From seeing them in that phase of their life to then seeing them happy, seeing them telling me, Ivan, I wish I would have come before. I, I didn't know that I could still be happy. They have become free. There is a way in which you could do that. I know it could feel at times that it's dangerous and that they could feel very fearful. But if they come to people like us, that this is what we do, we can walk them through it. It's good to know that there are resources out there for people who need help, for people who want help. So Linda, let's talk about the services Women in Distress is providing and how you've adjusted, really specifically adjusted to help survivors during the pandemic. So luckily, many of our uh, 41 centers provide a lot of the overlap services. So the services that um, Yvonne mentioned, the shelter services, we do have a large domestic violence shelter. Um, during the COVID times, we lowered the amount of uh, folks we were bringing in only for safety reasons. However, we have opened the shelter back up uh, completely. So we are back open all the way, but we always had outreach services and we continue to do so. We do a lot of training and development in the community. We bring survivors in and provide them with financial assistance. As Yvonne talked about, you know, ultimately the shelter is an emergency situation and we want to create an environment where survivors can leave the shelter, go out, um, have a job, be able to move into their own location, um, have a safe place that they can call home. And so that's what our goals are. And we work with the economic justice program to help them with things like understanding mortgages and being able to purchase their first home. Um, and, and we really encourage the survivors to look at therapy and group. And we do a lot of those here. Um, we work with a lot of the kids. We have a very strong children's outreach program here. And we also have a pet center. So for those folks who want to come to the shelter but are afraid to leave their pets at home, um, we have an entire area here for pets. And um, so, you know, we're doing everything that we can do to make people feel as safe as they possibly can at probably one of the toughest times in their lives. And Jennifer, do you, you want to add on anything about the resources uh, ABDA provides? I think the only um, additional service that uh, wasn't mentioned is that ABDA does actually have a two-year transitional housing program. And so uh, beyond mm -hmm. the, we like Yvonne in, in Miami, and I'm sure at Women in Distress are taking folks into our shelter and they're staying with us longer because of the pandemic, making it harder to um, secure employment uh, and then also find housing and, and all of those different obstacles. Uh, but with the two-year transitional housing, program, folks in our emergency shelter are able to apply into that program and have those two years to continue working towards their goals for economic self-sufficiency. You know, I've heard of many people say, well, why don't they just leave? But hearing you talk about the economics, economics is a huge part of this issue, isn't it? 
we're working with a survivor in our uh, two-year program uh, a while back, and she came into the program and her credit score was extremely low. And the reason that happened was because up until uh, fairly recently before she left her abuser, they had he had thought she had no credit, and so no credit equals bad credit. When they found out, he had sort of maxed out all of his stuff uh, financially, and so when they realized that her credit score was fairly good, started putting every, he started to put everything in her name and um, then over time stopped paying the bills. And when she came into our program, her credit score was very low. And so by the time uh, going through the programs that Linda mentioned with our economic empowerment programs, she was able to rebuild her credit over a 10 month period of time and be able to on her own rent in Palm Beach County for her and her two children to live safely. So those programs are really critical. John, one thing I, I we have to ask you before we finish tonight is is how can victims or I should say survivors of domestic violence, um, what do you want them to know as far as building a case, and 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 what temporary measures the court can issue for victims? Yeah, no, I I think obviously it's important if possible, you know, to, to try to take contemporaneous notes. Um, videos, photographs of any injuries, of course, any damage to property, you know, text messages are, are admissible in court, um, you know, threats of danger, any, any evidence of violence, um, you know, of witnesses of someone who's ever witnessed the violence. Um, but it's, in, it's important, I think, you know, courts look at um, what is the history. Um, there's various factors the court's going to take to look at. But you know, how long has it been since the last incident or incidents? Um, so, you know, contemporaneous evidence of those types of things uh, is very important, especially when you get into a court, because, you know, on an ex parte basis or at the initial petition, the court is looking at the allegations written down without having the benefit of all of the evidence per se. So at the hearing, it's all that's why it's generally ben beneficial to at least consult with an attorney who knows the rules of procedure, who knows the rules of evidence, who can assist in trying to get this type of evidence admitted into the court so that you are successful if you go to court. The worst thing that could possibly happen is you try to get the relief that you're entitled to and you fail to meet that burden of proof. And that's why having a skilled attorney to, you know, representing you at that hearing is beneficial in some cases. Um, but, you know, the most, from my perspective, the best thing you can do is try to get as much evidence as you possibly can, take contemporaneous notes, videos, things of that nature, and keep it, so hopefully, so you have it to present to a court. Any closing tips, maybe not just for survivors, but perhaps, um, you know, the general public out there who may have a suspicion that something's going on with someone, they may be hesitant on, on having that first uh, conversation with somebody. Any final thoughts? Uh, don't be afraid to talk to your friends and family about the issue. Really uh, be open and be supportive. And the other thing I would say is, you know, we talk a lot about domestic violence from the standpoint of what it feels like from a female perspective. But one of the things we know from working in domestic violence for a long time is that it really does hit every single gender. It does not discriminate. Um, domestic violence is across the board. And, you know, many of us work with domestic violence survivors from all walks of life. And we take in uh, all domestic violence survivors into our shelters and we work with them in outreach. So I just want to make sure that everyone knows that this is not a, you know, a feminine problem. It's a community problem. It took the words right out of my mouth, Linda. So I guess what I'll say is for those of you who are watching who um, maybe aren't necessarily dealing with this in your life or your friends and family are not dealing with this, but you're moved to figure out, is there something that I can do um, to assist and get involved? Um, you can certainly call that 800 number and get connected with your local domestic violence center. We do um, take volunteers. Community folks are great at doing donation drives. We're always in need of food, diapers, wipes, feminine products, um, linens for our, our emergency shelters. And so there's definitely lots of ways to get involved, even if you're not dealing with this issue directly. I want to thank everyone. Linda Parker. I want to thank Jennifer Ray, Jonathan Schiller. Thank you for the work that you do on this really important issue. And you can watch our full discussion, plus find more information on local resources for domestic violence survivors on our Facebook page at Your South FL.
Stay well, and thank you for watching.